the Ensemble podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. This content is created in partnership with our sponsor, Zurich Australia Limited, ABN 92 000 010 195 AFSL 232 510 and Palace Capital Proprietary Limited, ACN 616 130 913, AFSL CAR 1257 625 and is limited to publicly available information. Before acting on any general advice, you should consider whether appropriate and obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. Ensemble does not hold an AFS license and does not provide any financial advice or services or endorse any general advice. If a PDS or IM exists, you should obtain a copy and review it thoroughly before making a decision. Hi, I'm Andrew Rocks from Ensemble and I'm thrilled to be bringing to you uh, the podcast Engine Room that's devoted entirely to the practices or the business of the business of financial advice. Over the course of the next many months, we're going to be interviewing Australia's best independent boutique advice firms, their practice managers, their GMs, on what environment is conducive to being a best practice, how they keep talent, how they attract talent, and what the future of financial advice is. It's the Engine Room Podcast. Welcome aboard. Zurich is proud to be supporting this episode. The Zurich and OnePath Advisor portal is more efficient than ever before, giving you access to two leading brands with three highly sought after products, underpinned by two powerful underwriting engines, all with one simple sign on, making it easier for you to do business and perform at your best. Palace Capital is a leading financier and investment manager specialising in real estate debt. Offering tailored solutions through actively managed funds, it caters to investors seeking dependable income and monthly liquidity, with a total transaction value exceeding $5.3 billion and an unblemished track record of zero principal losses, Palace Capital delivers attractive risk-adjusted returns. The Palace Senior Income Fund offers monthly liquidity and asset-backed income, rated four stars by SQM Research. Partner with Palace to access tailored investment solutions. I'm Andrew Rocks and welcome to another episode of The Engineering. I'm still down here in Melbourne for those uh, playing along at home and I've had just the most wonderful couple of weeks meeting excellent uh, Melbourne advisors, um, but I have actually wandered off Collins Street. Um, only a few hundred metres. Um, I'm in uh, the head office of Rising Tide, and I have the pleasure today to do an engine room podcast with Matt Hale. How are you, Matt? Good, Roxy. Thanks for having me. Well, and thanks for having me. It's uh, another fan, another fantastic host. And um, we've been chatting before about um, change and the fact that uh, you don't you don't do much change. You like consistency and whatnot. And I was going to sort of. Uh, run that through your LinkedIn. Now, either you're hiding a lot of facts from a lot of people or you appear to have got left school, jumped into Deakin Uni, done the relevant course, jumped into financial planning and started your own business. Am I wrong in saying that? Where have I missed something? So effectively, you're spot on. I've had one job and the irony is they say the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. My old man's racked up more than 50 years in his Wow. One and only job. What, what does your dad do? He works in liquor. Right. Uh, okay. But he's a teetotaler. So so the irony is there. Uh, but I effectively finished school when I was 17, straight to Deakin, um, did a uh, Bachelor of Commerce with financial planning approved degree, which was pretty rare for m- mid-2000s. Yeah, wow. Joined Rising Tide, which was started by the former founder, Chris Brown. Uh, and I started, you know, sweeping the sheds back in 2007 while I was still studying. And fast forward 17 years and uh, rising tide, it, you know, we've rebranded. We've got our 20 year birthday coming up, and I'm close to 18 years here. Wow, that's, I mean, uh, yeah, it's it, it is. I mean, 50 years uh, um, um, is is magnificent for your father in that one career. And I did I did pick up the irony of being a teetotaler. It's probably the only way. So. Um, in relation to financial planning, I'm trying to think of the equivalent in financial planning, uh, someone who actually uh, financially plans himself properly, potentially. I'm not sure because, I've, I mean, I've been in financial planning and I need help. Like, you know, it's uh, you spend so much time thinking about other people, sometimes you think about yourself last. I think it's really important to have that support network around you, whether it's with your own money or your own mental health. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. So um, we're, in, we're in Melbourne. Um, have you always been a Melbourne boy? Yeah, I grew up you know, 40, 50 Ks east of Melbourne. And I suppose similar to, to your story where 40 or 50 Ks 
20 years ago was a bit further out than what it is now. Very, you know, pretty simple upbringing. Uh, Mum and dad, uh, you know, they were married really young. One sister who I'm still extremely close with. Uh, and we, yeah, we had a really simple life growing up. Um, you know, had a little bit of oh, a few interesting moments. Uh, my mum was pretty ill from when I was pretty young. Mm-hmm. She she had a long cancer battle, which probably we might cover off a little bit later of how I ended up here. But certainly that formed a lot of my work ethic. I think consistency, uh, you know, enjoy very much, um, I won't say the monotony of life, but I don't, I don't take a lot of risks apart from, I suppose, running my own business. This podcast is brought to you by Ensemble CPD. If I think about the professional development that it takes to become a financial planner that changes the lives of their clients, I'm thinking the math skills of an accountant, the legal skills of a lawyer, the personal skills of a psychologist. It actually takes a lot. And then on the other hand, if I think about how CPD has traditionally been approached, it's one of those things that's ignored and rushed through at the end of any given period. That's obviously a pretty big problem, so we set out to solve it. Ensemble CPD combines content accreditation, live streaming with compliance reporting, CPD management, and lastly, an LMS where you can upload your custom education. Our goal is to remove all the administrative burden from CPD so that you can focus on the parts that actually lead to professional development. To find out more, go to ensemble.com forward slash CPD. Yeah, well, it's, um, it is interesting. Um, you know, uh, Ensemble many years ago tried to figure out the avatar of, of the average financial planner. And for everyone out there listening, don't send the hate mail to me immediately. Just, uh, just do it progressively. But they're overconfident introverts. So sometimes they actually do like more of an introverted, more of a uh, sort of lifestyle, but they have to be overconfident because that's the part that that brings the clients in. Would you agree? Yeah, I think one of the things that I've learned along the journey as I've you know got into my thirties and, and now late thirties that what I thought I needed from a, a people or an interaction point of view was probably just a lack of real self awareness and congruency in who I was. So I think as I've got older, I've worked out I don't need other people as much as where I used to fill the gap with them. And I certainly enjoy a lot more uh, time to myself now and I really need it. Uh, But that's also encompassing that I've got two kids under five as well. Um, So my life has changed a little bit in that regard. Rosie and Max. Yeah, they are two um, unbelievable little humans. Um, And and my partner, Annie, does an amazing job. She's the captain at home. Uh, Yeah, it's amazing. My five-year-old is very similar to me in a lot of regards. Um, and Rosie's incredibly similar to her mum in terms of empathy, caring, and just, um, you know, a little bit cheeky. You've got, you're going to be voting to all in family decisions. So, I mean, have you got a rocks, paper, scissors scenario or what's the default? No, nah, unfortunately, <laughs> Roxy, uh, yeah, both kids go with Annie on all votes. So it's me and the dog yeah. losing two, three. Look, I, as part of this, and uh, I should do this more often, I'd love to see your Medicare card and figure out what rank you are. Because um, the Medicare card actually is the is the the org structure of every family. Well, mate, I can. This is not one word of a lie. I've got my own, and then Annie and the kids are on another one. So, so I'm, uh, yeah, I'm one out on my own out the back. I've been spoke approach. So, um, what made you do? So, the the degree you did at Deakin had some financial advice, and it was they optional subjects. Or yeah, that was optional. Look, I, I realistically, if I look back, I finished school pretty early. I wasn't sure what I wanted to do, but I always knew that I wanted to be around people and helping people. I'd sort of grown up in sales at Rebel Sport. Uh, I was a ball kid at the Australian Open. I, I worked at Tennis Australia for a fair period of time, and there was always a vibrant sort of space, but also a lot of flexibility. Did you ever get hit as a ball kid? And like I see those YouTube clips where they 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 cop it. No, I didn't cop it, but I, I was. Uh, yeah, it was a really amazing job. You had to learn how to to, I suppose, just play your role, yeah. but also as a 12 or 13 year old, sort of being out on court in front of 15,000 people. Epic. Yeah. It was, yeah, it was a real formative part of learning for me. Yeah. Wow. Um, but effectively got to uni and really was doing it so that I didn't have to make any choices in my life yet. I just wasn't ready. As I said, I started uni when I was 17. So, uh, finished that and then was really fortunate to connect with Chris Brown, the founder of Rising Tide. It, How did that happen? He literally, um, you know, there was a job board, a literal job board at, uh, at Deakin and he'd put something on there which said, if you're young, 
you want to work with people, you love travel, you love footy. Um, and that was like literally tick, 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 tick. Didn't even say what it was. Um, and he and I connected, yeah, out in Canterbury, which is the eastern suburbs of Melbourne. And um, around about that time, I was foolishly wearing some white leather shoes to a job interview, uh, which probably wouldn't... Sh- White yeah. snakeskin leather shoes, oh, wow. um, and uh, and we hit it off. Have pretty- you just come from a white snake concert? Or- well, no, I was probably coming from um, from Oaks Day or something. And in, in two thousand and six, that was about the um, you know maroon suit with white snakeskin leather yeah. shoes. We need to get some photos. This is yeah, that that would be outrageous. Your you, 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 your clientele today will have a, a real hoot of that, or they'll run for the hills. So it's debatable whether we'll, that'll go public. Look, they've, they've stuck around for seventeen years, so I feel like I've I've got past that now. Uh, PTSD is reduced with the white shoes, but certainly he and I, uh, yeah, had a wonderful time together. You know, we we spent hours out on the road. We were a very old school insurance superannuation business. A lot of M and A of books back in the day, and and I was there doing everything from writing SOAs to presenting to clients around insurance changes and super. So, well, I've just also just wandered onto your website. You've got 549 five-star Google reviews, and I'm just going to run it through uh, ChatGPT and see how many of them are white snakes in um, she related and uh, see see what the metrics are, the correlation. Um, So... You mentioned you're sweeping the floors, but it didn't sound like it was that long before you were having an opportunity to talk to, to clients. Is that right? Yeah, I was really fortunate, probably from day one, that I was in a lot of client meetings. And I think the trade-off was I was able to go into as many client meetings as I wanted to, as long as the admin was getting done. And so I busted my ass for a, for a good couple of years until I got my AR in July 2009 and really spent the next four or five years pounding the pavement. July 2009. Okay, so uh, for those again playing at home, I've I've had a run of podcasts where everyone kicked off pretty well when GFC happened. Um, so I'll ask the same question I've asked of, of, of quite a few of the other guests. What learnings did you what can like two or three learnings that you gained from being in the GFC as a front facing advisor? If I think about from an advice point of view. First, first thing is our clients have never and will never go into funds that have been frozen before. Um, that was diabolical at the time, particularly that we'd made a lot of acquisitions. We were picking up advice that we hadn't given. Um, right. Same as the Timber Corp stuff. You know, yeah. There was just some really average advice, which has formed our philosophies yep. now around how we give advice. The second one was showing real leadership to clients and leadership when people have emotion is hard. It's funny. One of our oldest clients, I remember at the time, she was in Horizon 7 in Master Key back in the day, internally geared. And I reckon her portfolio came off 60%. And I remember we were in there having the conversation and she was our highest client, the biggest fee paying client at the time. Ooh. And she wanted to, she wanted to pull back. And we just said, no, we've got to stick it out. You know, we spoke about when we're implementing that that things might change. Um, that conversation was in about June of 2007. We didn't realize that over the preceding 23 months that it was going to change as much as it did. And we were hard and fast at that point in time around if people were going to move their money to cash, we were going to disengage. Um, right. It was something that we just didn't believe. The numbers, the history just said it would always bounce back. And I know it's hard. Uh, but we 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 stuck with that, and we did the same thing in COVID. And and I will not deviate from that. You got to have your portfolio connected to your risk, to what you understand. But once you're there, there's no there's no moving because big stuff happens. Yeah, well, thank you for that. And um, it's uh, you're right. It's it's was not the time to go to cash. Um, but classic case of all of the unadvised people probably didn't have that check and balance, and uh, they. They did go to cash and they lost a lot of money. And people really wanted to. It was the most emotive time I can remember, particularly, you know, at that point in time, interest rates were at 7%. So it wasn't like, you know, now where there's this interest rate craziness that people are worried about what they're anchored to versus what it is now. It was the biggest thing, certainly in my lifetime. And so uh, as I talk to you today, um, you're the CEO of Rising Tide and, and, uh, Chris has has succeeded, and um, and sort of take us through that journey because that's uh, AR in two thousand and nine to being the boss. It twelve fifteen years later, how how'd that work out? Yeah, 
really congratulations but uh yeah yeah thank you and i've always been given the opportunity to succeed which has been wonderful and probably the biggest reflection that i did in the lead up to this was that i've been so fortunate to have incredible people that have truly cared about me and truly cared about the business throughout the journey so effectively we you know, we bought a lending business on in you know late 2000s then we bought a county business on and uh, Chris had a lot of stuff going on from a family point of view, two kids that needed a lot more help than a lot of kids do. He exited in April 2018 and and look, that was unbelievable to be able to have someone that you work so closely with to literally back of the envelope sort of shake hands and, and we worked out a deal to get him out and, and he's still a good mate now, which is great. Uh, that's what I see success is, being able to exit a business and still still have a beer with someone that, that, that you succeeded from. Um, and yeah, and I really see that rising tides had three phases. It was sort of 2005, the beginning to 2012, which is when we started to explore that diversification of client value, you know, the accounting, the mortgage broking 2012 to 2018, um, which was those form, those sort of middle school years. Yep. And then we started again, realistically when Chris left and Sam Gawenda and Sam Jewell really stepped up, um, from 2018 onwards. So those uh, the last couple of people there that come on um, around that time, and you know, you said you have three phases of the business. Um, I'm looking at some of your photos as we speak. Do they follow the the, the beard? So I'm, I'm I'm looking at a completely clean shaven uh, mat on one of your screens. I'm looking at the bush ranger, and now I'm looking at you right now with with stubble. So um, it, it appears that you don't like change except for one thing. Look, the irony with the beard is, I think when I was young. I had no wrinkles. So being in financial services, you, you, when you're 21, 23, 25, you're trying to look as old as you can. And then they come- You overplayed your hand, mate, with the big beard. <laughs> yeah, yep, and it is uh, and it is big and it's red. Um, and then all of a sudden you get to your mid-30s and you start to realize that uh, that those wrinkles are actually showing and you need to sort of try to take a few years off. You said something earlier about how um, when you first started, you were able to go into a lot of client meetings um, quite young, you know? Um, and we were talking um, earlier about, uh, you know, areas where you, where you think um, you guys can grow. And one of the ones was you're looking for an associate advisor. I think uh, is Rebecca is looking for an associate advisor. Um, if someone comes to you as an associate advisor, is that same philosophy going to hold still? Are they going to be able to be in meetings um, and observing? Is that kind of your philosophy? Absolutely. And, and not only is it a historical piece, it's it's currently now. So... As you said, um, Rebecca, who ironically is up for Advisor of the Year next week at the FAAA conference, is looking, we are looking for a our, you know, in inverted commas, our next gun. We've had an associate, Marcus, come on alongside Sam during the last 12 months. And the first six to nine months of, of his tenure, I reckon he would have been doing five to seven meetings a week. 12 months in, he's now playing a really big role in our review meetings, not only the preparation, but also the pre-review phone calls to clients two or three weeks out. And we'd absolutely expect, uh, you know, Rebecca's associate who may not even be in their PY yet or maybe a recent PY graduate, uh, but we want someone who's ready to, to roll the sleeves up, enjoys engaging with people, but is also really coachable because you'll get some pretty direct feedback. And and we've certainly learned that that helps, uh, that helps people hone their craft quickly. Oh, well, it's constructive. Right, that's that's the main thing. Um, people working in a vacuum uh, don't really get guide routes. So, um, and as far as yourself, um, two young kids. You're not an old guy now. You kind of you you got uni cracking pretty early. You started a business pretty early. It looks like you you've, you've established a wonderful kind of uh, a, 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 um, you know, you've got your children now. You do realise you've got like everyone has like 80, 90 years to run and you just want to get it done fast. Is that right? Yeah, Roxy. It's a really interesting um, part of, of my career at the moment. Um, probably the only change in my paradigm is, as I mentioned earlier, my mum passed away when she was 54 and spent a lot of time ill before that. Uh, so for me, you know, the life expectancy of 80 or 90 has never been the expectation. So your lens is absolutely, yeah, and which is, which is you know, it's a horrific um, part of your your childhood and well not even childhood into adulthood really. yeah yeah look horrific is one word i mean I, I feel really blessed i'm not a religious person but i feel really blessed to have had the learnings you know i feel like everyone's got their role to play and, and mum played a, a formative part in my life and still does awesome. probably the only frustration is that you don't um that one of your heroes doesn't get to meet your kids yeah. uh, that's unfortunate but i think 
a lot of my outlook and mindset uh, is very, very much built around that. You know, there's nothing to be complacent about, be incredibly grateful, um, but overlay that with it's never as good and it's never as bad as it seems. So we're going to talk a bit about, um, you know, change gears and thank you very much for, for um, your personal anecdotes um, and, and talk about Rising Tide. I just wanted to know the name. It's a pretty cool name. Where did it come from? Rising Tide. We spent a lot of time um, over probably 2010 to 2013 thinking about this rebrand. What was our voice? Who who we wanted to deal with? And effectively, we did and we do work with the Rising Tide. You know, Roxy, one of the things I'm really proud of compared to the industry is that over 91% of our fee-paying clients are under the age of 54. Well, and, and looking at your team, uh, most of your team appear to be in their 30s and 40s, if that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I'm definitely one of the veterans and, and not not 40 yet. Yeah. Um, and look, that also flows into, you know, the rising tide for us is those high income families with young kids that are going to be at home for at least the next sort of five to 10 years. They'll shift into that pending empty nester space. Um, and then Rebecca in particular does a lot of work with Women that are, you know, post separation have found a level of inertia in, yep. in their world, but certainly are looking to um, move to their next chapter financially. So the, the business of the business, uh, maybe give us a rough idea. How many ARs do you have? Um, and, you know, what's the support sort of uh, system for for each of them? What are you expecting? Um, for them to do? Well, I'm really glad to be having this conversation now and, and not 15 months ago. We had a really, we've had a really changing last 18 months. Well, you didn't return my call for 14 months, Matt, is that right? I didn't return a few calls and it wasn't it wasn't because uh, I was sh- had any shame around where we were, but I certainly knew we weren't where we wanted to be. Um, and look, I do need to give um, Dean Lombardo and his team from Effortless Engagement a really big pat on the back. Dean and I met we actually, when I run the Rising Star with the AFA a long time ago, he and I did the, um, the you know, the Australia tour yep. and hit it off really well and, and sort of fast forward 10 or 12 years. Um, he's re- Him and his team, particularly Sophie, have really helped us to change. So we've gone from 27 staff back to sort of the mid-teens now. Our team in the Philippines, in the Philippines has reduced. Um, we've gone from four mortgage brokers back to one. Our accounting business is gone. We now have three ARs. I am one, but I don't provide advice anymore. I do all the work at the, f- the front end, bringing on the ideal clients. Um, and then we're looking to build those two funnels, um, two pods under Sam, Jewel, and Rebecca. And then our mortgage broking team. So can I? So just, just, so the pods, you've got the ARs. And because you're doing a bit of heavy lifting, bringing in new business, they can really focus on the execution of of the client strategy. Is that correct? Yeah. So, I, so look, I, re, I would say that we will onboard, you know, probably sixty to eighty new ideal client groups this year and next year, um, and probably the year after that. Um, and that's why we need the associate because on in Sam's pod, you know, Marcus is doing an unbelievable job in terms of the review process. Uh, you know, there's not a lot of people like a Sam Jewell and a Rebecca Pritchard who can comfortably onboard 30 to 40 or 50 new ideal client groups. And, and how many, um, uh, so you've got the advisor, you've got an advice associate, and then you've got a, a team of people yeah, to, uh, in, in the Philippines as well who are helping do the administration file hygiene. Yeah, effectively, um, you know, the the client service team in the Philippines, we've got, um, yeah, we've got effectively two to three in each of those pods. Oh. And then we've got power planning in-house, um, some overflow externally if we need it. Yeah. But effectively, it's sort of, you know, advisor, associate, um, and then shared services through power planning and uh, and that delivery team, which is in the Philippines. And is it your view that the associates over time will potentially develop into their own ARs and you start a pod? Is that the organic vision of the business? One of my really big learnings, Roxy, so four or five years ago, I had I was misplaced in my belief um, that I needed to get off the tools completely. And so in a very short period of time, I handed all my clients off to Sam Jewell. This was as, you know, there was more needing more work needing to be done running the business from a marketing point of view, HR, all that stuff which I took on. And I basically just handed them off in one foul swoop. If I had my opportunity again, I would have continued to build that pod and just sort of cascaded the clients through uh, and build a build pods that are more diverse in terms of their skill set and their outlook and their beliefs. Uh, we have used this profiling up to this point in time. 
but certainly doing some work with Ensemble over the past couple of months. I'm, I'm really intrigued around the Gallup Clifton Strength stuff. I think we'll probably head in that direction. It was a little bit scary reading my own profile um, and reflecting on how little I have in the execution space and then looking at all the average parts of Rising Tide was around execution. And I think uh, Rebecca also attended that as well. What what, what was their uh, difference in, in profile? Really similar. Beck definitely is more empathetic than me. She, she she would put a hand up to say that. But but actually, if I look at our team, there is definitely a gap in that execution space. So whilst it's an associate now, I certainly think over the next 12 to 24 months, it'll be someone more in that general management space, operations that can sort of help get all the noise out of my head into execution mode. And look, my own financial planning journey um, with Announcer, we had a lot of very similar clients. They were at the time, we were kids with primary school. We were parents of primary school kids. We had lots of those types of people. Um, and uh, we, we we had uh, cash flow management was a big part. Mortgage broking was a big part. Maybe get a bit of a feel of the client journey um, through and sort of how, how do you how do you charge? Because a lot of advisors out there um, might be might be a jack of all trades. They might have some retirees, some were for accumulators, but you've hung your hat out as pretty specialised. Is that right? Yeah. The way I would say is that we're one of the very few integrated businesses when it comes to mortgage broking and financial planning. And that stems from cash flow structures through to philosophies, through to how we review clients, how to we how we communicate with clients. So one thing I'll say is we are a, an online business. We do all of our client meetings or 99% of them uh, via Teams. You know, we use technology the best we can from a compliance point of view. We record them. But the journey for a new client, let's say that irrelevant of whether they come organically or through a referral, they'll do a, a free intro call with me. We do have pretty strong filtering on our Calendly process to lead into that. So if they're not a, an ideal fit from those four or five questions, um, we'll sort of refer them back to Money Smart. So, so just to unpack that bit, so Calendly, which is quite um, quite a big take up. In fact, I use it. You utilize the calendar in the invite, you do a poll or you do a series of questions? Yeah. I've done a lot of work with the, the routing. So yeah. basically, it's a bit like a decision tree. Yeah. So you answer this question and then you sort of get to the end of it and say for us, it will be, you know, what's your life stage? What what is What's your mindset with money? That could be, I want to be better. I've got an impending inheritance or I've just separated. And then effectively, it'll either be, hey, yep, come through to the intro call or alternatively, we're not going to be the right fit, but here's some people that might be. Wow. Um, and if you're not sure, go to the FAAA and the Money Smart website and do a search there. That has taken us a fair bit of courage to do. It's really cool. Um, I've got to admit. And now we're at a point where our referrals are, are good. The guys have done a lot of work, particularly with um, David King. He does the tribal habits. Highly recommend for any, any advice business that wants to ramp up their referrals. I've got no commercial relationship with David. We did it back in 2010 as when he was view referrals. It's now called Tribal Habits, I think. Uh, look, Kieran, Kieran's here. He, uh, he, he loves researching. So Tribal Habits, it's all, David King. Yeah. David King. It's all about referring, how to refer, your ideal client profiles. You'll nail it after that. Um, and so they do the intro call with me. Um, depending on how they've come from, we'll always sort of I'll guide them around who I think, whether it's Sam or well, Rebecca or it's a purely a mortgage broking conversation to have. And then they'll go to a discovery session. That is a one off four hundred and forty dollar fee. Yep. We've gone back and forth and back and forth. Our guys put a huge amount of time, effort, and emotion into those discovery sessions. So we've now landed on a one off four hundred and forty dollar fee. Before that, they've got to get all their quantitative and their qualitative stuff back in. And then that discovery session is effectively trying to get them to their second or third draft of their goals. And then also start to think about the um, start to think about the strategies that might come to life. And I always say, you know, my role in this is I'm a little, I would say I'm a little bit like a really experienced dentist. You can open your mouth and that we haven't even asked you to go for Collingwood. So that's no, it. I'm a carton supporter, so all teeth are intact. <laughs> uh, but it's like when you go to a dentist, you open your mouth, they know within one or two standard deviations, what your story actually is. But it's really important for them to understand how you got there and what your perspective of your story is, Very why your teeth are like that. Yeah. And so I do that. I know what what strategies are probably going to be in place, but that's not fair. 15 or 30 minutes is not a fair place to, to drill into people's lives. So then I hand them off to SJ or, or Rebecca, 
and then we'll send through a proposal. Our project fees are, are anywhere from sort of, you know, six and a half to eight and a half up front. You know, we utilize cash flow and super depending on their circumstances. And then our and then our retainer, we, we won't do any one off work anymore, no ad hoc stuff. Um, unless people are on a retainer. And when did you when did you make that decision? Soft launch, probably two years ago. Um, the last twelve months has been pretty hard on that. But to be fair though, up front, if you think that um uh you might want them in your world at some stage and they can be a mortgage client, then you're doing that anyway and you're sort of creating a Another funnel, would that be fair to say? Yeah, I think, you know, the cost to serve of, of financial planning around that ad hoc stuff, it's it's gone skyrocketing the last few years. Um, yeah, and you're, and you're on the hook, right? And and so uh, and so then you, you, you're charging that fee, then you do the retainer and it's compulsory and the clients uh, are coming in, they're meeting, or they're not coming, sorry, they're meeting virtually. Yeah. Meeting virtually, um, your team members. The types of uh, clients, do you actually do any retirees? We've got a very, very small amount of retirees, more legacies. People will refer their parents. Yeah, they will. Yeah. Um, and that's why we've got, you know, we've started to build a really strong network around us. As I said, 50, 54 and under is about 91% of our VPAN clients, uh, which I think compared to the industry average is nearly flipped on its head. Um, look, one of the other things, Roxy, that I- I speak to some practices and they say, oh, look, we, how we do with our young clients under 55. Uh, that 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 comment happens, and uh, um, yeah, so you're right. So so fundamentally, we think about you know loosely based around a Maslow's hierarchy. Your, your financial planning foundations are everything from getting your estate planning done, which we refer out, cash flow structures, buffer in place, life insurance, which is the formative parts of my you know I, I pounded the pavement for a long time doing insurance, and I love it. And if I go right back to the advice that my parents didn't get, um, you know, that had a fundamental change in our financial circumstances and what could have been. Yep. Um, so we, you know, if I talk about us not wanting to do ad hoc work, for a long period of time, we haven't done work with clients who don't want to engage with the life insurance conversation. Well, I mean, coming um, from from everything you spoke about, it's just, it just, it, it, it doesn't make sense. Yeah, it's, it's amazing, you know, we... When I see those claims come through still, you know, we had a, uh, only a few weeks ago, we had a retrospective, a client that I'd done the policy for back in probably 2014 um, with one path, they, a client re-engaged, they had sort of gone off into the wilderness. We're still doing the mortgage broking, you know, a few admin pieces on the insurance and Sam Jewell caught up with them a few weeks ago and did the full discovery and found out that she'd had a um, quite a heavy skin cancer. Um, and we just got a you know fifty six thousand dollar trauma claim paid, which is you know she's passed all the care, but it'll be life changing for them. Yeah, wow. Um, you know to be able to help their kids to be able to sort of go back and pay some of the bills that they big borrow and stole for to to make happen at a time when interest rates were going from two to six percent. So yeah, that that insurance piece is fundamental and a non negotiable in any business that I'm ever a part of. So um, you've mentioned that you've, so you're still doing insurance in-house. It makes complete sense. It's part of the process. Um, how do you find the delivery of it? Because I do speak to advisors, and with, with the, the reduction down to 60%, um, how do you make a fist of it, given that also your clients are a bit younger, so their premiums aren't as high? Yeah, you've got to build it in. You've got to believe in it. And I think that's why for us, when I talk about an integrated model, as you're walking through and, and, you know, we effectively are doing the fee for advice, um, you know, around the super and investment bonds and cash flow structures, and then there's lending and then there's insurance. You can certainly make it work. Um, it probably took me a while to rationalize that advice now is not what it was and, and it's not who it was for. Um, you know, really, honestly, we help more people go from good to great then 15 years ago when we were charging $440 to review the super and insurance and we helped people, you know, at the foundational level, um, it's changed. Uh, but I'm really comfortable and really proud of the advice that, that we give and and that I think the insurance piece, you know, just plays a formative part in that. And um, getting to the uh, sort of a bit more detail around um, investments. So, uh, who are you licensed with and, and how do you run your investments? It depends when this goes to air. We, we we spent 13 years with Apogee, which was part of the MLC group at the time. We then made the move in uh, December 2017, um, which I would say was about 27 days before um, someone got up on the stand at the Royal Commission. And we just joined AMP. 
Um, 27 days before that. So we had a baptism of fire. Shout out to Rowena. She's still the, uh, the ice mistress stare. We, uh, we have spent the last, since December 2017 at AMP, and, you know, December 2024, we'll be off to entirety. And, and we're really excited for that change. I think, you know, AMP has provided a really important part of what we've been able to do in maturing our business. We've d- done some great work with PwC through them, understanding cost to serve. Um, thinking about, you know, the heavy compliance regime that we're sort of are starting to come out of. And I'm I'm excited for what the next chapter brings with engaging with people like AZNGA and and Entirety and, you know, Paul Barrett um, and Neil and their team, along with, you know, with Matt Lawler, who's been a really big part of our business too. Yeah, wow. Okay. So um, the, the investments, because, uh, you know, do you, do you run it as, as an SMA structure that they've got or how do you manage to do that? Because it might be the key at the moment for your clients, but they'll be all contributing all the time. So it's growing all the time. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, we've had a really interesting journey. We spent the first seven or eight years through the um, indoctrinated in the, the Master Key Horizon series. The great things about that is it taught me about auto rebalancing, about consistent contributions, about I think value for money. We then made the move to index investing in about 2015, and that's still where we stay now today. We've the last 12 months has been great. We've we've spent some really valuable time with um, with the Net Wealth team, um, and uh, and BlackRock as well. So we've now got our the way we sort of think about it. Majority of our clients are in those higher, um, you know, the 100 percent growth, the 85 percent growth, and the 70 percent growth portfolios. Yep. Um, so net wealth, we do a lot of that via BlackRock, um, and we've got what we'd call sort of two streams, and and you've got your more vanilla stuff, and then you've got the ESG. So our conversation, where I'd love it to be, it's not perfectly there yet, but understanding people's risk, you know, how long their goals are, is it, um, you know, is it investment bond sort of space? We do a lot of investment bonds with Gen Life. I think they do an amazing job, and we're really proud to sort of partner a lot of our clients with them. Um, but yeah, it's it's. The time frame of your goals, which sort of dictates the environment that you're in. Is it super? Is it um, bonds? Or is it you know more personal name investing? Most of our clients are not self-employed. Um, and then it's on to, is it the more vanilla stuff or is it the ESG? And, and there's obviously a spectrum of conversation there that Rebecca and our team leads. Um, and then it's the risk profile. Um, so I see, And then it's contributions. So yeah, we're starting to, you know, as I said, I'm really proud of the journey that our clients go through from an education point of view, but also overlaying the science and the art of advising. I firmly believe that no matter how good a business like Rising Tide is, people still buy people. So Rising Tide and Matt Hale, that's a nice little background. But when someone sits physically or digitally belly to belly, they still buy the advisor. They're, the advisor is the one they text. You know, they're the ones that they they you know discuss their problems with their dreams. So you sort of need to provide the advisor enough space to to do the artistic stuff, the rapport, the comfort, the connection, which I, I think our guys do as good as anyone. But then the science needs to be make it easy for the advisor to roll through that process for its consistency, um, which helps remove the noise. About 10 minutes ago, you sort of were very honest in saying that that uh, 14 months ago, you had a look at the business um, and uh, you almost did a controller reboot in the way you did things. Um, did you take a reduction? And how did that play out? I mean, did you get a reduction in revenue? Did you increase profit? Like, what, what, was, the, what was the outcome of that quite radical move? Yeah. Uh, I've been pretty honest about this throughout the whole journey. And, and I certainly think throughout my whole journey, I've been really honest about where I've been personally and also where the business has been. We've had some great places, we've been to great places. We've also had some not great places. High level, you know, our uh, our turnover has increased um, as we've reduced from sort of 27 back to, as I said, mid-teens um, in people across both Australia. We've got um, Mags, one of our amazing CSRs is in South Africa. Um, she came via acquisition of the old wealth enhancers business that we did a few years ago. Um, but effectively what it's meant, one of my biggest learnings is that we added people, which added complexity. So if I think about, you know, if I could go back to, to that real sort of, you know, before the game locker room conversation to myself 10 years ago, it would be understand the complexity of your own business and do not add more people as problems arise. 
Yeah, you, throw, you can't throw bodies at it, can you? Because what it, what it does is um, it adds handoffs, it adds double handling, all these little bits and pieces. And the one thing I know about humans is that if you've got them at 100% capacity and then they go back to 80, that's the new 100. Correct. So all of a sudden, I think we'd grown and, and the intent was really, really solid and noble. And the culture that we that we had at that point in time, I mean, one of my highlights of my career, we had 22 of us over in the Philippines for one of our team's wedding, um, you know, over there. So Kate got married to, to Angelo over there and we did offsite um, in Cebu, which was amazing. But that team looks nothing like what it is now. And that's only, that was January 2023. In many respects, um, financial advice has really only been going since the, the, the early 90s. You sort of got on board, you know, a, a decade after that. You've been growing up as well. And, and look, I'm going to ask you some other questions now. Do you have um, other shareholders other than yourself? Have you established a board? Is your business growing up? Certainly, yes. So we, there's been a few bits and pieces, but but as it stands today, two major shareholders, myself and, and Sam Gwenda, we sort of give or take I think it's 40 to 45% age, or it's not 45 because Sam Jewell has got 20%. And then Rebecca came on earlier this year with a minority shareholder um, space, which is amazing. Um, you know, I'm homegrown. Um, Sam Gwenda, who who heads up our mortgage broking business, he was a brickie. Um, we played footy together, bought our first home together, uh, first investment property together. Um, and he went over to Perth with that mortgage broker and, and learned his craft there, came back in, in late 20. 20- 10 maybe. Um, so he's sort of homegrown as well. And then Sam Jewell was the same that I was to Chris Brown. So so SJ's been here for 10 years and he was my apprentice. Um, and he's now, um, you know, him and Beck are sort of leading the charge from the advice point of view. So we've got a really mature but small shareholding group. Um, I'm the oldest, um, but we've got a lot of experience in terms of years at the crease. I I rely heavily on Peter Warren. Um, he's he's our chairman. When one of I think one of the things I'm Does he Dr. No? Yeah, he knows everything. No, no, I mean, Dr. No is in no more ideas. Oh, <laughs> no, if, if anyone knows Pete Warren, he, he has a lot of ideas. I'm probably the, I'm probably the one that, that kiboshes the ideas sometimes. I was chatting to him yesterday and, um, uh, you've got a chairman who's also pretty good at tech stack, right? Which I'm going to ask you a question about tech stack. So, um, but so you've built this and, and how often do you, do you meet? I'm trying to get the governance of your business because yeah. if I'm an advisor and I'm looking to join a practice, I want to get a feeling that there's a bit of an established path towards me getting a share in the game. And is that what you're building out? Yeah. yeah, yeah. And so, I mean, quarterly shareholders meetings, um, really consistent and transparent financials. Uh, we have strong, we are, um, whilst we are mature, we have a really strong dividend policy. We do pay out, you know, a good chunk of dividends. We all of us have a fair bit of personal debt, you know, young families, that sort of stuff. So we don't want to- You, you all live in Melbourne. You, we all live in yeah. Melbourne. Yep. So we refresh that pretty consistently. Uh, and a lot of the decisions that we- I, I think maturity of a business is how far in advance you're starting to think about your decisions. And for Rising Tide now, we have less knee-jerk reaction decisions. They're more considered. Um, you know, the two people that I lean really heavily on, as I said, is, is Pete Warren, obviously the, the team internally, and then a lot of conversations over the past 18 months with Dean Lombardo. He's, you know, he's grown a business, an advice business. He's sold out of it. So having that experience there and, and you know, I'm, as I said, as I said earlier, I, I've been really fortunate along the journey personally to have a lot of amazing people that have shown real care and commitment to me. Um, and, and I do leverage that and I hope that I give some on the way back. Um, but I'm, I'm just incredibly grateful for those people. I can pick up the phone and have a conversation with so many people that I trust and respect. Well, yeah, I mean, it's, um, it, it, it's a definition of happiness and wealth, isn't it? Right. It's just, if, if you can, if someone answers the phone or if you have a barbecue and people come around, um, I'd like just to touch on, um, running cause you're a remote first with your clients, which has been there. Um, we're in Melbourne, which meant you had you, were quite, you had a pretty heavily enforced remote only uh, period during COVID. But you now run um, half a dozen uh, uh, people in the Philippines. Is that right? Yeah. yeah so, our t- and, and what's 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 your f- couple of tips to people? Because this is not new anymore. But I know there's a big difference between employers who do it well and people who do it poorly. And what do you think are the attributes of your business that does it well? 
It's a really deep question and I'm philosophizing about this a lot. I think the first decision that you need to make is what role do those people have in your business from a a task point of view, but philosophically, are they a part of your team? And if they are a part of your team, you have to integrate them and facilitate a place that feels like the water cooler is there. Even if it's it's having them on a website like you do. Yeah. Yep. And, and, but also Roxy, one of the things that I've sort of come to grips with is that I think it's okay to have them more as subcontractors. As long as people know what their role is. <clears throat> That's just me uh, having a fit. So, so uh, why, why, why Matt uh, refreshes his, his water there, I, I, I totally agree. And I think you mentioned then about role. Can I then parlay that comment back to, you know, having throwing people at, at problems? Did you think that, that when you looked in the mirror, you just didn't have good role? Uh, like you hadn't got good roles and job descriptions? You weren't granular enough? Yes, to some extent, but there was also some fundamental beliefs that I think were wrong. One of the things that we went down the path of, particularly with our team in the Philippines, was trying to empower them to become experts. So we had uh, you know, experts in insurance and superannuation, but what we found was we've now moved to a model where they're more generalist. They definitely have strengths and they gravitate towards things, but let's say that you and I are both in that team and you're away, I can pick up some of your... Yeah. Slack. So your capacity management's better. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, That's probably the biggest one. Uh, And then also just the, the overarching clarity around what people are doing every day. We then got to a point where I think we were micromanaging a little bit too much because there was doubt. There was. You've you've created silos. Um, And so some people were probably working at 120%. Some people were at 50, 60%. You're probably giving more jobs to the people that were at 120%. <clears throat> they might be unhappy or leave. It, it's a it's a vicious cycle. So getting it right is important. Yeah, I think that would be the thing if I could go back is to go be really clear with your process, what that means from a cost to serve point of view. Um, we're now sort of in the position where as the associates come on, you can sort of cascade down, you know, the advice cost right through and, and that's going to continue to play out. You know, we're, we're consistently looking at what our vision looks like, where we would like our EBIT to be, where we'd like our ratios to be with how many clients an advisor or a pod can serve. Would you like to share any of those? Aspir- like where, where you want it to be? Aspirationally, I think, you know, probably if everyone got a dollar for every time someone in my seat said this, I think tech can play a reasonable role. But I firmly believe that we can get an advisor with an experienced associate somewhere between 160 to 210 client groups. Wow. Uh, That's where I'd like it to be. And I reckon from there, you can then start to cascade that down to make that tail longer. You know, you can, the numbers you mentioned up front about new business, you could organically do that over five or six years from a standing start. Yeah. And I look like basically in 2018, we had a standing start to some extent. Don't know if you know um, people remember, but there was the ongoing fee agreements. Um, MLC back at the time decided to turn them off a lot earlier, so we had over four hundred thousand dollars in revenue, which was basically turned off overnight. Which was full on because I was realistically only six months into taking this role. But you know, we yeah, we rolled. It's an email you read twice, isn't it? Particularly when we were no longer in the tent as well. So we'd spent twelve or thirteen years at Apogee, where you've got this nab. Um, you know, goes to MLC, you've got Apogee, you're sort of in the tent, you know what's going on and you've probably got some power. We'd left 12 months earlier to go across to AMP, and, you know, back in that era, MLC and AMP were probably the two big groups that were going at it from an advice point of view. Uh, so we had no, we had no control. You know, we were having a look back that was via a, a licensee that we were no longer a part of. Um, there was a lot of stuff going on. We, we had a lot of challenges, but you know, if I if I go back to to that consistency and that determination that I think Rising Tide inevitably has as a you know as a bit of a flow on from my world, um, it, you know, it's been good fun. And what I always like um, I- I- to ask is, you know, why do people join you? Um, why do they stay and how they grow? And we have touched on a few of those, but I'm going to actually parlay the question with a filter, and I'm going to read your off your website your trademark behaviours. So here I go. So at Rising Tide, we like to show care and empathy. We like to take responsibility. We like to deliver on your promise. We like to have the right conversations. We like to enjoy the ride. What I'd like you to do is sort of using those tools, explain how your team operates and and are you hitting all of them? 
Yeah, well, I think we we cascade in and out of living our trademark behaviours. Yeah. I think if I reflect back on probably the two to three years previously, individuals, including myself, weren't taking responsibility and I certainly wasn't having the right conversation. The right conversation is not necessarily a degrading conversation. It's more creating that sort of 360-degree feedback where you can have a conversation which might be uncomfortable, but someone can get past the intensity of what's being delivered by knowing it's coming from the right place. Uh, the way that our team does it, I think we've started to create a really consistent place where those conversations can happen. Funnily enough, that often can become through the consistency of the environment. You know, one of the great learnings that I've had in the past 12 months is, you know, making that feedback loop really clear. We do triannual reviews. We actually get, so So one of the, um, one of the girls in our um, delivery team, Mag, she's super experienced. She worked in Shell at corporate. She's unbelievable at just creating an environment where these reviews flow well. She's not technically trained in financial planning or mortgage broking, but I've now got her in all those reviews and I feel like it provides a great impetus to good conversations, which means that I can then take responsibility off the back of it, um, have the right conversation both during and after, but there's a real consistency. We do peer feedback and we also do a self-reflection. Um, that, did you use any um, any tools? We use Microsoft Forms. We did. We've sort of rolled in and out, but as the team's contracted, it's become a little bit easier. One of the the things that I'm really proud of, uh, we went to the team about 12 months ago, and the feedback was anonymous initially. And we sort of said, one of the questions: Would you be comfortable? Would you like the feedback uh, to be whatever the opposite of anonymous is? Um, I. And yeah, the key thing was people wanted to know where it was coming from, what it meant and who it was from. So basically, you know, I've got a couple of reviews this afternoon and tomorrow and I see what the guys have said about me. I've got my self-reflection, um, what I've done well, what I can improve on. It's just those two questions. I think from memory, we we used one called Office Vibe or something like that back when um, when I was running the business. And But Microsoft Forms, as as Microsoft has, is, is now pretty well does most things building out and and then the enjoy the ride has certainly changed along the journey as we've gone from you know we were if i think about 10 years ago i was 28 lived you know we all lived close we had a table tennis off, table it's in Dockland. off we had a bar in the office yeah. wow. so, and, and everyone would sort of remember and probably rising tide at that point in time was not mature we were probably known for for being you know maybe a bit of a lads business that's and, what was the opposite of mature <laughs> that's right so hey look everyone's everyone's been there and so that's that. So, how does it? How do you enjoy the ride now? Yeah, well, I, I shared the example of um, of taking the team over uh, to the Philippines last year. You know, we have our our virtual Christmas party. The Melbourne team connects every Tuesday where we are now, but the rest of the time they're from home. Oh, I'm just saying that you're growing the beard because are you Santa? Mate, well, I could be. I I needed to get a little bit wider. Uh, maybe 2026 might be the go. Yeah, maybe if compliance doesn't improve and we move to uh, to entirety, the beard might go completely white. Oh, uh, to be fine. So, so you have a virtual, a virtual there, and then if I'm working in your your business and I'm getting these triennial reviews, that's all great. And some some people are shareholders, and there's a clear path towards ownership or a share in the game. But how do is is do you have like a any sort of bonus structure or what? What are you sort of working on in the background as the bridge for say I'm coming as an associate? Obviously, I've got to do my time and I'm getting experience, but if, is it like a, a three or four year plan or what's your- Look, it really depends on where people are coming from. True. Um, you know, we have scorecards. So basically, tick the tick the boxes. So compliance opens the gate to, to bonuses for people in the advice team. Awesome. Then roll through to, you know, two or three things that are related to your role. Yeah. Um, and then it's generally a percentage of um, a bonus pool. And my favorite question almost on every podcast- who reviews you? Who reviews me? It's Pete Warren. So, so I've got some uh, some time upcoming with him in December. Um, which, yeah, and some of these conversations of where the business has come from has been those formal reviews. But I'd also like to think that I'm probably my own harshest critic, as as cliched as that is, um, and you hear it. But I think I'm reasonably comfortable now as I've matured a bit to not take things personally. And it's also been one of the really good parts about moving from an advice role into more of a management role. I'm less implicated from a day-to-day point of view in terms of when you're an advisor, sometimes 
the hard stuff is what creates more work for you. So I'm comfortable now that we've got a really broad sort of spectrum of what perspectives people are coming from with the decisions we make. Um, we've got a broader shareholder base. We're really clear, as I said earlier, about our dividend policy. I think that there's just less there's less moving parts now because we're talking about it in advance. Yep. And I've got to stress that that um, you mentioned that you you engage your clients um, digitally, but uh, I'm sitting here in, in a lovely office in Burke Street. You, you have an, some of your team work together, or what's what's sort of the cadence of of how you guys all meet? Yeah, I mean it's really interesting. I mean I think be, one of the things we've learned is that there's a there's a good amount of time you need to spend together. You know, so a couple of the guys, you know, they work out of a co-working space down in the Mornington Peninsula during the week. A couple of us come in here a couple of days a week. That associate will probably do a day in the co-working space in the inner north with Beck and then a day in here with us. So we do try to spend as much time as we need together. But equally, you know, we talk about, you know, the freedom to say yes and and those yes moments for our team are as important as our clients. And a lot of the time that is being able to make sure that home's going okay and they're spending time with their kids or they're spending time with their loved ones or they're taking the dog for a walk. So we we never wanted to create a business that was, you know, the inside of the bubble, everyone's sort of smashing themselves and not getting getting a chance to have their yes moments. And our clients were, you know, enjoying this incredible journey. Can I ask, um, is there any piece of technology and you're using all the technology that the, 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 the practices in your AFSL use. Is there anything in addition to what is currently on that that, that you're investigating or you're using? So one of our gaps at the moment, oh, look, I'll give you a bit of an overview. The ones that I religiously sort of use, we've, we're trying to we're trying to explore more and more of the Microsoft suite. Me too. Yeah, because so, you're paying for it. Yeah, and we do pay for the Copilot license on top. Same. Yep. And we're so we're starting to use a lot of that. We have recently jumped on board with FileNotes.ai. Um, so that has proven to be a really good initiative for us. I think we'll continue to make it better. Uh, I do lean on people that actually came from a chat with, um, with Rachel from NetWealth during a fire alarm at their summit. I'll always take the opportunity to sort of, you know, um, grab people when I get the chance and just find out what they're doing, similar to how you go about it. Uh, Calendly, as I said earlier, that's, that's a non-negotiable in my world. Yep. We, one of the things that it's not perfect, but I really like how our proposals go out to clients and that's via Quilla, which is yep. Q-W-I-L-R. We, it's not fully integrated by any stretch, but it looks sexy. You know, I really like, and I'm fortunate I get all the acceptances, I get the viewed and every time I look at it, I just go, compared to what most other businesses are doing, like some shitty email that says we're going to charge you 10 grand i feel like that's arrogant yeah i mean i i, I was using ignition software which is an accounting one and it's practice it's, ignition yeah yeah it'd be very similar it is it is yeah. the, the only thing that i like about quilla it is just a bit more it's a bit more what you'd expect to sort of get from like a marketing business around that proposal oh ignition's mainly accountants yeah <laughs> exactly and we were like, when we had the accounting business we used that so that's probably one that I, I like. We use My Prosperity for our, a lot of our engagement with clients. We're sincerely hoping that we can get a few more integrations as we move over to Entirety. Um, shout out to their tech team in advance, uh, which I think will help us. Being a digital business, that's sort of our semi shop front to some extent. What, um, you know, being so young but having so many years in, in the industry, what do you see as the future for advice practices? I mean, you've got your ecosystem, what we've spoken about, but maybe just cast your lens out there. What do you see as far as the way in which they're going to arrange themselves over the next 10 years? My absolute non-negotiable belief that hasn't changed um, is that people will always buy people. Uh, I said on Monday in a similar sort of setting to this that I think you need to have good advisors Sorry, you need to have great advisors and a good business. Absolutely. So my one of the things that I talk about in every intro call I have is that I'm not objective to this at all because we've set our business up like this. But if I was going to engage with an advisor off the street and they do not have a strong business behind them, and what does that mean? It's all those things we spoke about. It's maturity, it's consistency, it's philosophies. I wouldn't engage with that advisor, even if that advisor is a superstar uh, because he, there is... Yeah, like I said, there's a science that the business can deliver and then there's the art. And at no point do I want an artist thinking about science. That's an awesome term. 
Um, so, you know, one of the passion pieces of, of me doing the engine ram over the last couple of years is that you can only have the best advice given if you've got the best ecosystem around that advisor, um, or else they're literally swimming against the tide. I completely agree. You see what I did there? It's, it's, I'm, I'm stumped. Hey, Roxy, one other thing when you ask about, when you ask about tech, I know that, that you do a lot of work with Bonjoro. Uh, I would say to any advisor, any business owner, that if you have not sent a video out to one of your clients today, let alone this week, you will fail in the next five years. I think you're right. And people are consuming it. You know, you're, if you hop on the train or the tram and everyone's got their earbuds on, they're all consuming YouTube clips, they're on Netflix. They're so used to doing it. And uh, another one is just get the subtitles. Um, yeah, yeah. Which is pretty easy to get. And and the overlay of that is, you know, deal with the people how they want to be dealt with. And, you know, like I have an inadvertent probably 100-word limit in my brain when I'm reading, but that's with emails. I can read a book. I love reading. I love listening. But if someone sends me an email that I have to scroll, <laughs> it's just to the back of the queue. My favorite emails that I've written over my entire career start with, pursuant to our conversation, please find attached. I don't even know what pursuant means. <laughs> yeah, it just means we've already had the relationship part. It's not being done on email. It just means that this email is just, it's execution. It's not relationship building. I actually read something yesterday that said meetings should only be to decide. Yeah, right. Um, well, I'll go one more. We're getting very philosophical. Uh, a business uh, coach of mine and a good mate, um, uh, when I was a, uh, a CEO of Training Wheels, he said that the role of the CEO is to make decisions. And so if you're an indecisive CEO, you're not a CEO. And uh, that uh, that still haunts me. You know, it's one of the things that I like to impart on people who are just going down that path. And just on that, I'm, I would say that I'm a CEO with the biggest training wheels on. Does it get easier? Uh, yeah, because one of your decisions is to say no. And I think that um, the, the general... Um, upbeat nature of a lot of uh, financial planners because you've got to be you've got to you've got to be upbeat and motivational for someone to sign up to become a client right they, that, that, that's what that's part of it but that the, the double-edged sword is that quite often you're upbeat on every every idea right and um and uh, i think by making decisions you and saying no um is quite powerful and, and the older you get the the more it works yeah i, I am excited to hear that we've had a pretty big 12 months, as I said earlier, with a lot of pretty hard decisions and, you know, the good people where, you know, if you're moving them on or you're letting them go, it's, it's really hard. But I think having the maturity of the business, a really clear vision of where you want to be, it sort of makes it easier to think about, you know, where you're headed. But nonetheless, it doesn't, well, particularly in, in my experience, it's so bloody hard. Yeah, it is. And it's, it's hard because it's, um, and uh, you're growing a business, right? And you're trying to build the business, but at the same time, you want to make sure that you're doing it in an ethical and sustainable way for your clients. You, you've got all these competing things and you, you've got to carve a narrow way through to, to stakeholders such as your family and other, other shareholders. But the things that you've mentioned around transparency of financials, around structure, the fact that you've got someone reviewing you, you're well and truly on the path. You know, there's, you are in the, you are past the halfway mark of getting it right. I can tell you that much. Um, no one ever gets to the finish, by the way. That's that's a misnomer. But but having those things and those pillars in, and and not just covering up everything, um, all all the time, having that brutal honesty is 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 will mean that your business will have a great foundation, and you then have the luxury of with this great foundation and this great cultural foundation, you can make it as big or as small, as wide or as narrow as you want. It's the world you estimate. Yeah, I think the the conscious decision making process. It's a lot easier to say yes when you've said a lot of no's as opposed to where we probably worked at how hard it was to say no once you've said a lot of yeses. And uh, people's expectations um, will continue to get higher unless they're checked, um, and whether it be with clients or anything. Um, yeah, so it's, it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's really interesting. And, and you know, we hope at Ensemble that by socialising this, both in, on the engineering podcast and in our growth collective, of which uh, you attend the physical catch up a while ago is it's just you know in the old days no one wanted to actually say they they did something wrong whereas I think now the, all the greatest learnings come from 
you know, uh, those anecdotal failures. And, and, you know, I've got them a mile long. It's, the, it's sort of, it's the fabric of your life. Um, but, but sharing on a platform like Ensemble that's not judgmental that works is, the, is, is a, you know, the reason I'm massively involved in it. Yeah, I think it's really important. You know, what I would love to see is, is those anecdotes get shared closer to the time they happen because I feel like we're all great at sort of sharing the historical losses as opposed to the ones when we're, you know, when we're up against the ropes. I think your generation are better at socialising this, you know, like uh, the younger people coming through um, are probably a little bit better and, and, and um, the word uh, uh, vulnerability, you know, I didn't know that was a word um, until you know, 10, 15 years ago as well, but authentic vulnerability and whatnot is, 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 is really good. And historically, women have been a lot better at this than men, you know, from a, and from just putting a very wide ranging comment there, but, you know, that's, that's been something that they've done because, you know, you, you think back over the years, uh, Work can sometimes be easy. You can organize it. One not for kids. Kids don't have rule books, right? So the moment you become a parent, it's like they have to uh, be be constantly micro adjusting all the time. Yeah, the the trade off between IQ and EQ is more omnipresent than ever before. I think absolutely, absolutely. So I've got to take this opportunity to to wish uh, your team good luck at winning the award, and Rebecca or Beck uh, in particular. Um, by the time this uh, goes to air, um, we're just going to say she's a finalist and hopefully winner um, of Australia's, Australia's um, Best Financial Planner. Yeah, so the FAAA, they run two streams, yep. the CFP and, and yep. the old AFA one. And look, Beck is one of the most balanced people that, that I know. She absolutely fundamentally deserves to be up on the podium. Awesome. The uh, the decision's already made, I assume. So now it's the waiting game. But nonetheless, I think it provides a really good pat on the back for the, you know, for the three on both on yeah. in both streams that they're doing the right thing. I think there's enough uh, credibility in the process, um, but also, you know, for our clients, for our team, you know, for Beck's offside of Lester, who she works intimately close with, um, and he's in the Philippines. There's just some great stuff that comes off the back of it and, and the ability to, um, you know, I think the opportunity for good people to tell their story is completely, um, completely underrated. Oh, absolutely. And, and you know, a shout out to um, all, all the finalists as, as you very humbly um, reference them. Look, I've had a great time unpacking uh, your, your engine room. Um, you've gone through a, a good journey. Your, your honesty has to be a reason why people uh, are attracted to you. I mean, that's just in my one hour of talking with you today. I feel that whether you know that or not, that's that's that they, that would be the case. And I hope I know that listeners will find that. Um, and a big thing is thank you very much for being a great contributor to the ensemble over over the years as well. Um, in in their previous manifestations and their and their current one. So a shout out from from all of all of their our team because they asked me to make sure I did it. So it's now official. Um, so uh, thank you very much, Matt. Thanks, Roxy. Really appreciate the opportunity. Um, and and the, the same thing, if people want to reach out, if they've got questions, queries, thoughts, crossroads, uh, I'll always be as open and honest as I can be. Yeah, look, we're going to put some links um, uh, to Goza Fish. You've got a couple of spots open. You're looking to, I think, at a minimum, uh, uh, get an associate advisor, uh, might be associate advisor to Australia's number one planner by the time the ad goes out. Who bloody knows? But but you know what? We can do that. And that's all about giving back and socialising. So um, again, good luck. And thanks. Thank you. Thank you.